Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Laura Olivos. I'm a licensed uh, psychologist in Miami Beach, Florida. I specialize in working with children who are neurodiverse. I also specialize in trauma and developmental disabilities. I'm really excited to be here today to join in with Dr. Maria Pinola to talk about a really important movement uh, called neurodiversity. So thank you for having me. Well, Laura, thank you so much for being with me today. I appreciate you uh, accepting my invitation to join the show today. So can you tell me a little bit about neurodiversity? How do you define neurodiversity? Well, Dr. Pinola, thank you so much for having me. And yes, neurodiversity is defined as this social movement that started in the 90s that really emphasizes uh, inclusion for um, people with neurological differences. And really the premise is that neurological differences are to be respected, accommodated, included, and accepted. And the viewpoint is that neurological differences are needed for our society to thrive. They're not to be stigmatized or to be cured, but rather to be celebrated and leveraged as a way to uh, celebrate uh, the various types of, of ways of thinking and perceiving the world. Tell me a little bit about how early can autism be identified and how is it identified? It's a great question. So typically uh, we see that autism is most typically diagnosed between uh, 18 months to three years of age. However, we're starting to see that more micro array, array testing, uh, chromosomal testing in the womb and utero is uh, becoming more popularized to detect different genetic variances that allude to, um, to having autism. We don't really consider those chromosomal tests to be definitive or diagnostic in nature, but rather as more of like a sign. Um, the way it is diagnosed, in, in my opinion, is that it has to be done through thorough developmental testing. There isn't really a uniform way to diagnose autism across uh, different professions that do work with this population. You do have differences in diagnosing uh, when you go to a pediatrician versus a neurologist versus a psychologist and versus a psychiatrist, right? There's these professions that can diagnose, but the way they diagnose and approach diagnosis can vary from professional to professional. I'm a little biased in my training where I really consider developmental testing through a battery of assessments to be the most thorough and mindful way to, to diagnose. Well, so when I when I reach out to you to come and join me today, I you sent me some inter very interesting videos about autism that I really appreciate you sending. There is one that we're gonna share the link with people, but basically it's a, an, an autistic researcher who talks about the fact that only seven percent of the research conducted on autism has the focus of like making autistic people's lives better. <laughs> Everything else is basically for treatment and just figuring out why it happens. And, and this is a problem. She, what? And to find a cure. A lot of it is very Yeah, and to find a cure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and she says this is a major problem because one in 50 people are autistic. 60% of autistic people are under or unemployed. 85% um, have a mental illness. They are also nine times more likely to die by suicide. So um, tell me more about that. Like what, how do you see, like how can we move forward? Where should we be focusing on? That's an excellent question, and I think this is why this movement is so important because really it puts autistic voices at the forefront of policy making, decision making, um, treatment to support them, and enhancing their quality of life. And for a long time, uh, as we were stumbling through trying to understand autism throughout the century, um, we really looked at it through a pathological lens, and we looked at it as a, as a deficit. And so what happens when we have that perspective is uh, autistic voices and people and neuro neurodiverse individuals become marginalized and uh, suppressed. And that inevitably, I think, has a detrimental consequences toward their mental health, toward how they perceive themselves and how they're able to function and thrive in society. Um, and so 
the video you're referencing to is Dr. Jennifer Denhouting, who's uh, based off in Australia, who her, her, she herself identifies as an autistic person and researcher. And her premise is to really kind of bridge this gap. We need more autistic people in research, conducting the research, defining um, how to view autism and on redefining it really uh, in, in, in mainstream uh, medical communities and, and in social communities uh, to really enhance the, the idea that their voices matter. And I think when that principle and whether it's research treatment um, or community supports is, is when that principle is the focus, I think that's when you'll see, and, and this is my hypothesis, that you'll see that, there, that the community will inevitably uh, improve in their outcomes. What do you recommend parents uh, to do if they suspect that their, their child might have autism? So it's a big question and I think it's such an important one and it really depends on who you ask. There will be varying answers and I think that in and of itself can feel overwhelming for any parent that's starting this journey. Um, but I would say from my perspective that the first step to do is obviously to take a deep breath and be compassionate toward yourself and that you will inevitably um, not find all the answers at once. I think many of our parents try to scramble uh, to immerse themselves in all different literature, uh, speak to all sorts of different professionals, sign their children up for all sorts of different therapies that they read about or Googled, and it can feel so overwhelming. So I just first wanna empathize with that piece. But the second thing I would suggest is that you um, start off with a baseline of data for your child to look at their developmental profile. So instead of seeking out in the testing piece, um, just ruling out autism, my suggestion is that the focus be on not just looking at autistic traits, but looking at how they function in the spectrum, right? What their sensory uh, profile looks like. Are they sensory aversive or are they sensory seeking? Uh, what their executive functioning looks like, their language, um, their socio-emotional functioning and how they're able to express their feelings and cope through and navigate their world. Um, so I think having a baseline of, of their profile inevitably informs how you're going to select uh, supports for your child. Um, and that can look like um, everything from uh, helping a child integrate their sensory environment through occupational therapy or enhancing gross and fine motor skills, to speech and language therapies, to um, uh, different, you know, I'm a little more biased with, with therapies that are more neurodiversity affirming, such as floor time or Ross Green's um, collaborative uh, problem solving approach. Um, but there will be inevitably so much information out there. My thoughts are to also consult with autistic adults on the matter as well, and not just rely solely on um, medical doctors, psychiatrists and psychologists opinions, but actually speaking to people who are on the spectrum. Um, that would be a big recommendation on my end. The other, the other suggestion I would have in that area too is, enhancing your child's ability to be able to connect with you and communicate with you and feel safe and have a predictable environment that's foundational outside of any therapies that you kind of pursue to support them i think it's it's first and foremost i think the foundation needs to be to also consult with your child if you're able to on what their feelings are toward their treatment plan have them have their voice uh, as a part of the treatment plan as well versus um you know just making those decisions uh, without them. Can you tell me more about the what treatments are currently available? So the most popular kind of hallmark treatment that we see are more behavioral oriented approaches, such as applied behavior analysis. Um, this particular movement and perspective that celebrates neurodiversity has had a lot of controversy toward this approach because a lot of the way they perceive interventions is is through a lens of them trying to kind of suppress their autistic traits. Um, for example, uh, ABA, for example, is renowned to encourage eye contact in a child on the spectrum. And many people in the neurodiversity movement feel that there's a whole set of reasons why they don't necessarily make neurotypical eye contact 
uh, that being the way that their peripheral vision works, the way that they have to scan their environment, their sensory integration. Um, often they can read emotion at a much more magnified uh, rate, according to a lot of self-report, and it can feel overwhelming to stare into someone's eyes. Um, and so, for so their perception of what treatment needs to look like is that it be inclusionary and respectful of their neurology versus trying to change their neurology, if that makes sense. Another big example in the ABA piece that they kind of have issues with is the stimming piece. So for example, if you have a child who does repetitive movements with their hands or they rock back and forth, um, or you know they uh, have different fidgety kind of uh, behaviors, that's looked at in, in the neurodiversity community as a way to express themselves and regulate their bodies. And so a lot of times, for example, different behavioral therapies try to suppress um, those, those traits and those behaviors because it's not uh, becoming, right? It's not something that looks neurotypical, therefore it needs to be changed. So although ABA is the most common treatment approach, uh, more and more autistic voices have kind of spoken out about their issues and their problems with this approach. Other alternatives that people tend to really um, celebrate and seek out are more neurodiversity affirming interventions while still being evidence-based. And so the, the treatment focus needs to be on not just curing aut you know, autism and, and, and that therapy look like the suppression of autistic traits, but rather supporting um, autistic individuals to navigate their environment in a more inclusionary way. So different interventions like that can include occupational therapy, where a person is working on helping them integrate their sensory environment in a safe way and enhancing, for example, fine and gross motor skills. You also have speech and language therapy, which is used to help children find their voice and communicate in, in their own way, whether it's through an augmented assisted communication device, whether it's through an iPad, whether it's through a sign language or words or their own voice. Um, and then another piece that I stumbled into uh, that I'm getting training in too is in uh, floor time, which is a Greenspan and Weeders uh, developmental model of approaching autism through uh, a relationship-based intervention to help them move up the developmental ladder and find a sense of safety in their relationships. Um, so <laughs> I know that that was a lot of information, um, but that's typically kind of where this movement um, what this movement advocates for in terms of, of therapies. What parenting techniques do you recommend for parents of toddlers with autism? Particularly parents of children who have behavioral problems. I see parents who are working from home may have trouble caring for their children at the same time. How can they keep their kids occupied and appropriately stimulated? It's a wonderful question. And I probably could take up a whole hour going through that because that's what I do for a living. <laughs> Um, but I will tell you this, um, the first foundation for any uh, strategy that you want to apply with your child, regardless of the age, by the way, is your own self-regulation as a parent. There are these neurons in the brain called mirror neurons. And what we know from the research is mirror neurons are indicated in how a child learns and develops by looking at their caregivers and the people in their zone of proximal development or their environment, right? And so what we've seen most recently in the research emerge is that mirror neurons also are indicated in, in how children look toward their caregivers on how to respond and feel their way through the world. So if my, if my parent is escalated and agitated and anxious all the time, um, then I'm going to assimilate and kind of mirror that, that level of anxiety or dysregulation as well. So I would say that the first foundational piece toward helping a child is really looking inward and finding ways to, for you to gain a sense of safety and, and security as a parent, right? The second piece that I would recommend is that once you're able to find that regulation, and I'm not saying, by the way, that all parents need to approach their kids like a Zen kind of Buddhist monk and, you know, always be regulated and always be super, you know, uh, uh, perfect in their approaches. But I would say that if you're able to model even your own regulation and coping skills to your child, then you're already a step ahead, right? So even if you're having a moment, telling your child, mommy is having a big feeling right now. She's really stressed out. Mommy's going to take a couple deep breaths and I'm going to get to you in a second, right? So you're, I think that's foundational. 
The second piece is being able to reflect and narrate and kind of validate the emotional experience of the child, let's say in a stressful moment or a dysregulated moment, despite their behavior, right? Unless it's an unsafe behavior. If it's an unsafe behavior, that's a whole set of other strategies. But if a child's having a dysregulated moment where they're stressed or melting down or crying, the first thing you want to do is be able to hold that space for that child, right? So something like saying to the child, I'm hearing you're really angry about not getting ice cream for breakfast, <laughs> right? Um, you don't have to agree with, let's say, a negative behavior they're doing, but you're looking at it through the lens of first creating a sense of safety for the kid to feel that they can feel something in front of you, that they're allowed to express that feeling, okay? And then while you're narrating that emotional experience that you're observing, you're helping the child create self-awareness of what they're expressing and what they're doing, right? So that's number two, right? So first parent self-regulation and then validation and reflection of, of, the, of the emotion. The third piece that I, I tell my parents is that if, if to, to provide a sense of choice to the child, a sense of autonomy over their environment and control. If they're upset that they can't get ice cream for breakfast, present them a way to feel some control by giving them other alternatives and choices, right? The same can be said throughout their transitions throughout the day. Typically as parents, we think that, you know, their, their routine has to look a certain way and we fail to include the child in being able to have a say in their preference, preferences or what they might want uh, throughout a routine. So I think also incorporating that, those choices uh, is important. The fourth thing I would say is no matter what you're doing, whether you're trying to validate and reflect the feeling, holding the space, regulating yourself, if your child still persists and still melting down and upset, that it's okay to take a step back and tell the child, hey, I'm right here to help you work it out whenever you're ready, mommy's gonna be right here. And not necessarily try to keep fixing it or try to instill logic in the child and have them reason when they're not available. And that's a neurological phenomenon. At times, parents try to engage their children through logic and reasoning when their actual primal part of their brain is over firing and their logical part of the brain is not truly available in those moments, right? And that can also be looked at through the lens of, um, of, of trauma, right? When you think of fight, flight, freeze, logic is not available. Verbal uh, expression is not as, as readily available for the child to tell you exactly what they need um, or what they're feeling, right? So it's okay too to not have to fix it right away, that you can hold that space and allow the child through co-regulation and creating that safety for them to de-escalate. And then I would say the, the fifth thing would be to also recognize when the child's able to, to make a choice to cope um, or is able to de-escalate for you to highlight that for that child and celebrate that, that, that victory with them. Um, so for example, praising them for the fact that they were able to calm their body down with you and make a choice to move forward. Um, so <laughs> I know that's a lot, but those are, those are some tips. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. And what parenting techniques do you recommend for parents of school age children with autism? Particularly for parents of children who do not want to attend the school or don't want to complete homework. Yeah. So this is a really common uh, problem that I see a lot in my, in my practice. Um, frustrated parents coming in because especially in this year, learning has been flipped upside down, the experience of learning, right? Um, and there are so many other demands with virtual platforms, I think, than in regular school settings. Um, so I would say for, for school-aged children, that I would apply much of the same that I just spoke about earlier in terms of techniques of how to approach an emotion and how to help regulate. But when it comes to academics, I think predictability and having a sense of, um, structure and tailoring education toward their individual profiles is essential. Okay. So accommodating their, their profiles to support them so they can thrive in an educational setting, I think is at the forefront. Um, some techniques that can be used, let's say, with children that are school-aged is to create a sense of predictability through a schedule that they can also find choices in. So for example, if their morning routine involves them getting dressed, brushing their teeth, and having breakfast, maybe allowing them to pick um, what kind of toothpaste they're going to use for their for their brush the brushing of their teeth or what outfit they want to wear. Um, 
or um, what order they want to do the routine in, right? Allowing them to feel they have that control, especially like if they're getting to getting ready to go and sit down and do homework or, or an academic task, um, that they also feel that they have something to go by that feels predictable to them. So they feel some sense of control and autonomy. Okay. Um, that can look like a visual schedule. So I'm a huge proponent of visuals, especially for kiddos who are visually oriented in their learning style. Um, I, I'm a, the, the queen of clip art <laughs> and creating different ways to communicate to the child what to expect throughout their day. Um, I also am a huge fan of chunking, which is a technique that's used when children are easily overwhelmed by tasks that are in front of them. For example, if you put a math worksheet in front of a kid and a kid just refuses to do it, if they feel overwhelmed by it. My suggestion is that instead of creating this really busy worksheet that you're giving them, separate one to two problems on a separate piece of paper and just have them chunk each, each um, item, right? A, a couple at a time versus a whole worksheet that they're having to visually take in and feel instantly overwhelmed by. Um, I think also collaborating with your school, um, whether there's an accommodation specialist or an IEP team, if you're in the public sector, is in incredibly imperative and important for them to receive supports that they are entitled to by law. Um, and I think also when it comes to learning, creating a sense of playfulness um, and creativity and, and kind of thinking outside of the box with your kid and, and, and also leveraging their interests. So many kiddos on the spectrum actually have specialized interests, things that really they're passionate about, you know, different subjects, whether it's space or dinosaurs or uh, the wiggles or um, different uh, areas of, of interest, right? Take those interests and in, incorporate them into their education. For example, if you're trying to help them problem solve, um, a, let's say a word problem, take whatever interest they have and incorporate it into the word problem so that they feel that the material is something they can connect with meaningfully, right? Um, and then the last thing I would say is to help your child feel seen and validated by presuming competence. Many times I work alongside educators um, or therapists who presume that the child is unable to do a certain thing. And when we just assume a child is unable to do a certain thing, we inevitably create kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Where we kind of tailor education to be below what they're able to show us. So, and it also makes them feel less than, right? So my thought is, and there's a lot of wonderful research to back up that if you presume competency, if you give children the chance and the opportunities to show different abilities, that they will thrive better. So there was a study conducted in 2016 by Dr. Bell, and Dr. Bell was looking to uh, evaluate and assess intelligence in, in nonverbal children. Because um, typically what happens with nonverbal autistic children is that they pr they're presumed to be um, less intelligent. And so he set out to conduct a study of the largest to date, which was over 1400 participants uh, in, their, in a sample size. And he um, evaluated children, nonverbal children through nonverbal intelligence assessments. And what they found is that often uh, children on the spectrum who are nonverbal do have a, a nice core intelligence abilities and set of abilities, despite their inability to communicate in a neurotypical way. And so he said something incredible. He said um, that we've, we've linked, it's a strong indicator that we've wrongly linked an inability to speak with an inability to think. Um, and so I thought that that was really important because often nonverbal autistic children are the most marginalized in my opinion and underserved.